Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital. Welcome to Yale Cancer Answers with your host, Dr. Anish Chagpar. Yale Cancer Answers features the latest information on cancer care by welcoming oncologists and specialists who are on the forefront of the battle to fight cancer. This week, it's a conversation about the care of patients with kidney cancer with Dr. Michael Hurwitz. Dr. Hurwitz is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Medical Oncology at the Yale School of Medicine, where Dr. Chagpar is a Professor of Surgical Oncology. Michael, maybe we can start off by you telling us a little bit more about yourself and what it is you do. Yeah, so I am uh, one of the urologic oncologists here at Yale. So that means that uh, I'm not a urologist. I don't do surgeries. Uh, it means that I, ter- I take care of uh, people with cancers of the urological system, and that's uh, kidneys as well as prostates and bladders and testicular cancer. Um, and about half of that I do, a little bit under half is kidney cancer. So that's a lot of what I do. I also happen to have another hat here where I do all the what are called the solid tumor cell therapies, which is sort of an unusual therapy. It's experimental at the moment, but yeah. Cool. Well, you know, when we think about all of those genitourinary cancers that you mentioned, kidney and bladder and prostate, we often think that prostate is is probably the most common and the one that we talk about the most. And yet half of your patients have kidney cancer. Can you kind of put that into context for us in terms of how common is kidney cancer and and what does the landscape look like for kidney cancer? I mean, who who gets this? Who's at risk? Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Uh, kidney cancer is is less common. Prostate cancer is is extremely common. It's uh, it's uh, the second biggest killer in men in cancer, and it's probably the the biggest number of actual patients in men because many many do very very well. Um, kidney cancer is a little bit more rare, uh, but there are about fifteen thousand new cases a year. Um, most of them actually are going to be local to the kidney itself, meaning they haven't spread yet. And most of those are curable just by removing it and even sometimes not removing it, but destroying the cancer within the kidney itself. Uh, and then, however, about a third of them will eventually spread outside of the kidney. And those, it's pretty rare that we cure them. Probably 90% of the time or more we don't. Um, kidney cancer is a disease of uh, sort of 50s and 60s is the most common time to develop it. Um, A little more common in men than in women. And uh, unlike some of the other cancers, it's there, there are risk factors. They're not huge, meaning that there are behaviors you could change that makes it make it less likely that you'll develop kidney cancer, but they don't have a gigantic impact. So the big ones are things that you should be doing for general health anyway. So smoking increases your risk by about, um, 40 to 60 percent um being uh overweight increases your risk but you have to be what we classify what's called obese meaning your body mass index is greater than 30 um, and that increases it by about 20 to 40 percent um and having high blood pressure actually increases it a little bit by it by maybe again 20 to 40 percent um and then there's some exposures uh if you worked in in factories that had a lot of organic solvents those things seem to increase risk though it's a little bit complicated uh, and then there's some rare, uh, but but extremely important if it if it happens to you, uh, genetic uh, um, risk factors. So there are certain genetic syndromes. Probably the most famous is one called VHL or von Hippel Lindau syndrome, in which people get a number of different cancers, um, including cancers of the kidney, um, some cancers of the brain and of the um, adrenal glands. Um, it's unusual and almost always, though not always, it's in families. And so if it's sort of notable in your family that there are lots and lots of cancers of the kidney or some other things like that, then that might be one of those familial disorders. Hmm. You know, when we think about kidneys, we, we think, you know, they're kind of buried back there in, in the retroperitoneum behind the, the abdomen. Um, so it would seem to me that it, it you know, it's not like we're going to find a lump in them like we do in breast cancer. And, you know, what are the the signs and symptoms that people should be looking for if, if, that might tip them off to, to kidney cancer? I mean, how, how do these get diagnosed? Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, uh, point totally well taken. That's exactly right. Uh, this is not um, like breast cancer, your, your, your area of expertise. 
Um, you know, so, so kidney cancers, they used to be primarily diagnosed by um, really two things, uh, which was either you would urinate and there'd be some blood in your urine. Uh, and the workup would eventually reveal that there was a cancer in the kidney and, and cancers can bleed or they can, uh, let's say, damage some of the local tissue and then that can bleed and that would show up in, you know, when you pee. Uh, and the second way it would happen, you, you would notice it is if you had pain. Um, you know, if it's, if it's there and if it's invading some other area, maybe invading into a nerve, you can have pain. Nowadays, most of the time, the way we discover it is because someone had a stomach ache or something and uh, maybe um, had food poisoning or something like that. They go to the emergency department and the emergency doctor appropriately gets a CAT scan because they're worried about something and they see an abnormality in the kidney. They see a mass there and probably half the diagnoses or more are made that way now. Kidney cancer isn't um, as easily found as, as a lot of the other cancers. The, the good news, I would say, is that a lot of kidney cancers, not all by any means, but a lot of them are relatively slow going. So if you find them this way, most likely you find it and you can take care of it. You know, Michael, that's going to give some people some pause because they're going to be thinking, well, you know, when I get a stomach ache, I don't really go to the emergency room and, and get a CT scan. And, you know, if so many of these kidney cancers are found serendipitously that way, maybe there's a kidney cancer growing inside of me that I don't know about. I mean, should we have more regular screening or, um, you know, do we just wait until we have pain and, and bleeding? H how does that work? How do we think about um, early detection of kidney cancer? I mean, I think the way we think about it is not unique to kidney cancer. I think the way we think about it is how we think about screening in general for cancer. So there, this exact idea is not entirely new. I think this idea really took off a lot in the 1990s when we had started, or even the 80s, when we began getting really good CAT scans, where the CAT scans were very informative. You could do a CAT scan on somebody and really see if there were abnormalities all over the body. And so the question arose well, gosh, why aren't we doing CAT scans for everybody all the time? And some of these sort of studies were done, and there was really no evidence that people lived longer if you did a lot of CAT scans on people. It is true. Things do arise, and you don't always feel them. But it turned out that it didn't really make a difference. There are certain things we should all be doing, right? Um, I, I think there's no question that we should be doing screening for colon cancer when you hit sort of the age of 50. People should be doing screening for breast cancer, which you could say a lot more about than I could, but mammography. Um, I think the age is a little complicated, but somewhere between the 40s and 50s. Um, as a prostate person, I would say we should be doing prostate cancer screening with PSAs in healthy men ages 50 to 70. And there are data that maybe if you are um, black that you should be doing it from beginning at age 40. And these are things where we know there's, there, there's strong evidence that people will live longer if you do that. Whereas for things like kidney cancer or other things, even like pancreas cancer and things like that, there are no data that doing this makes a difference in people living longer. So I wouldn't freak out about the fact that you're not continuously looking into your body to find out what's going on there. Um, the data just don't exist that we should be doing that. And, and I, the other thing I would argue is if you start looking for things, not knowing what you're looking for, uh, what happens is you find things that you don't need to find. And then you go down a rabbit hole trying to figure out what those things are. It can lead to surgeries. It can lead to biopsies. It can lead to all kinds of problems. Um, and so in overall, I don't think that, 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 that the take home from this should be, oh my gosh, we got to start doing screening all the time for everybody who are otherwise healthy. Yeah. And I think part of that goes to what you said earlier about, you know, so many of these kidney cancers are, are really pretty slow growing. They're, they're kind of indolent. And if they sit there for a while, um, oftentimes that, that won't cause any major issues. Is that right? That is right. That is right. Uh, you can't know for any particular person, but yeah, that's that's right. Um, you, we, as I said, these things are found often incidentally, uh, and basically about seventy percent of them are found and cured just by by taking them out when they're found mostly at random. So clearly, most people do well. It, it doesn't say that for everybody, of course, but but yeah, exactly. Okay, you know. 
So let's suppose we have a patient and um, they, by one way or another, they have either started uh, to notice some blood in their urine and they, they go get checked out and they end up getting a CT scan or they ended up in the emergency room with a stomach upset and had a CT scan. One way or another, a mass was found in the kidney. Now, Oftentimes, when we talk on this show about things that are found in various parts of the body, we kind of say, you know, things can be benign and they can be malignant. So I presume the same thing would occur in kidney cancers. Um, so how do we tell the difference? Is the next step a biopsy? Yeah, so th uh, that's a particularly good question for this particular disease. Um, and the reason has to do with something that is not exactly a myth, but is no longer correct. But if you look it up, look it up on the web, you will see all kinds of stuff about how you shouldn't be doing biopsies for kidney cancers. Let me actually explain what I'm talking about um, rather than talking in circles. The answer for most cancers is when you see something, you don't know what it is. The only way to really figure out what it is, is to take a piece of it. Um, and, and look at it under the microscope. And that is what a biopsy is. We take a piece of something, we look at it under the microscope. The, in kidney cancer, way back when, and we're talking, you know, at this point, before the 90s, so 80s, 70s, 60s, um, if you did a biopsy of a kidney cancer, there was this risk that you'd put the needle in, you'd take the needle out, and as you took the needle out, some of those cancer cells would spill into that part of that body which you called the retroperitoneum a little bit ago, and that you'd actually spread kidney cancer. And that really happened. However, um, we don't do biopsies that way anymore. The biopsies are done in a much more controlled manner. It's actually, the needle is put in, but it's done through a sheath. And the last example I've ever heard of, of this happening was back in 1991. So we're over 30 years since that. If a mass is found in, a, in the kidney, in general, the answer is biopsy. And the reason is that nothing in a CAT scan or an MRI scan or an ultrasound or anything will tell you exactly what it is. And there are some lesions that uh, are, are abnormal, but they're not cancers and they don't need to be treated. And the issue is, if you don't need to treat it, the last thing you wanna do is take out part of someone's kidney. Kidneys are useful. Uh, we need our kidneys. Um, and so, I think the answer in general is biopsy. Of course, there are caveats depending. If the mass is extremely large, um, if the mass is causing ongoing bleeding, if the mass is causing a lot of pain, you may want to take it out and not do a biopsy. But in general, the answer is, yeah, we biopsy it. Okay. And so when we biopsy these kidney masses, can you kind of give us a, a landscape of what are the potential things that you might find? So, you know, there are often different kinds of cancers that might be treated differently or have different prognoses. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah, so so exactly right. It, it could be a kidney cancer. It could be something else. Uh, the vast majority of the time when you look at it, under the, under, uh, you know, on the CAT scan, you can kind of say, yeah, this is probably a kidney cancer. If it's not, there's always a chance it's an infection called an abscess. There are also some non- cancerous conditions that are related to cancer, something called an oncocytoma. Um, and then within kidney cancer, by the way, there's always a chance it's a different type of cancer like a lymphoma. That's quite rare, but it can happen. Um, but um, in, in, the kidney, in the kidney cancer realm, uh, the main type is something called clear cell cancer. Clear cell cancer is about 75% of it. Uh, and we treat it one way. And then there are a bunch of other small subtypes we treat slightly differently, which I can get into in a bit. All right. Well, we need to take a short break for a medical minute, but right on the other side, we're going to talk more about kidney cancer and how we treat all of these different types with my guest, Dr. Michael Hurwitz. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers comes from Smilo Cancer Hospital, where their cancer genetics and prevention program includes a colon cancer genetics and prevention program that provides comprehensive risk assessment, education, and screening. SmiloCancerHospital.org. Breast cancer is one of the most common cancers in women. In Connecticut alone, approximately 3,500 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. But there is hope thanks to earlier detection, non-invasive treatments, and the development of novel therapies to fight breast cancer. 
Women should schedule a baseline mammogram beginning at age 40 or earlier if they have risk factors associated with the disease. With screening, early detection, and a healthy lifestyle, breast cancer can be defeated. Clinical trials are currently underway at federally designated comprehensive cancer centers, such as Yale Cancer Center and its Milo Cancer Hospital, to make innovative new treatments available to patients. Digital breast tomosynthesis, or 3D mammography, is also transforming breast cancer screening by significantly reducing unnecessary procedures while picking up more cancers. More information is available at YaleCancerCenter.org. You're listening to Connecticut Public Radio. Welcome back to Yale Cancer Answers. This is Dr. Anise Chagpar, and I'm joined tonight by my guest, Dr. Michael Hurwitz. We're talking about the care of patients with kidney cancer in honor of Kidney Cancer Awareness Month. Now, right before the break, Michael was telling us about the fact that oftentimes these kidney cancers are found incidentally, kind of serendipitously. You either see some blood in your urine, you might have some pain. On the other hand, it might be something completely unrelated. You have a stomach ache, you go to the emergency room, they do a CT scan, and lo and behold, unbeknownst to everybody, there's a little tumor there sitting in the kidney. Now, these aren't always kidney cancers. He was telling us that some of these might be benign, but some of them are kidney cancers, and the majority of those kidney cancers are something called clear cell. Now, Michael, you mentioned that there were a variety of other smaller cancers uh, or smaller types of cancers that also occur that might be treated slightly differently. Can you tell us a bit more about the prognosis? Is clear cell associated with the best prognosis or the worst or somewhere in between? Yeah, it's somewhere in between. Uh, so, so again, about 75% of what you're going to see is this clear cell type. Um, and there, there's something else that's about 12% called papillary type. And those are really the two big chunks. And then there's something called chromophobe, which has a very good prognosis. It, it rarely spreads. Um, it's very slow growing. Um, and then there are a bunch of very unusual types, um, many of which are, are, are pretty, have, have pretty bad uh, prognoses. We don't have a good treatment for them, but that's a very, a very small part of it. I should point out there is one other thing, which is that, you know, when we... Um, cancers in adults, about 85% of them arise in the linings of tissues. Uh, so, you know, breast cancer, it's in the ducts of the breast and prostate cancer, it's the ducts of the prostate and kidney cancer, it's the linings of, of part of it. And in bladder cancer, it's the linings of the bladder and the tubes that go from the bladder all the way up to the kidney. You know, the, the urine's made in the kidney. It goes down these tubes called ureters into the bladder. And the lining of those tubes goes all the way up into the kidney. And sometimes you'll see a cancer up there um, that you think might be a kidney cancer. And really, even though it's in the kidney, it's really more like a bladder cancer because where these things arise tells you how they will behave. So that's a diff that's that that's probably, you know, 10% of what you see up in the kidney. And those are treated very differently. Um, but uh, but but anyway, that, that I got a little bit off topic there. No, totally good. So that tells us why a biopsy is so helpful in terms of how we treat these. So let's let's dive in a little bit more. Let's suppose that somebody does have a, a kidney tumor that's found um, on a CT scan, does have a biopsy. And, and let's start by talking about the most common kind of cancer that's seen, that clear cell cancer that you were mentioning. What might patients anticipate in terms of how their treatment and staging and so on and so forth might proceed from that point? Yeah. So the first thing that, that is going to happen uh, is probably you'll see a urologist and a urologist is a, a surgeon, a urologic surgeon. Uh, and they're going to going to see if they think it can be removed. But they're also going to do something that you just mentioned, staging, which means they're going to probably do scans, probably a CAT scan of the rest of the body to make sure that they don't see anything anywhere else. If you see things somewhere else, meaning masses somewhere else, then they might want to biopsy that other mass. And if it looks like it's something that is kidney cancer that has spread, then at that point, the treatment is going to be with someone like a medical oncologist like me. Um, not always. If there's maybe only one thing that has spread, sometimes they'll try to take that out and take out the mass in the kidney. Now, assuming it is local though, meaning there's cancer only in the kidney. We don't see it anywhere else. 
then, and even if it's in some of these things called lymph nodes surrounding the kidney, then probably the, the urologist will arrange to remove the kidney, uh, assuming that the, the patient is able to undergo surgery and assuming that the patient's kidney function is adequate for it. Some people don't have kidneys that work that well, and if you take out one kidney, then the patient will end up um, having to go on dialysis. And then that's a really important conversation that you have with the urologist about, about what you want to do. What proportion of these cancers are localized and where surgery is possible? Yeah, about 70. It's pretty good. So so that's great. Um, and then the other question is, you know, do they have to take out the whole kidney? Because I can imagine that people are thinking, like, I know that I have two kidneys, but man, you think about being at work and having two people's jobs being put on one person, they might be thinking the same thing might apply to kidneys. Yeah, exactly. So uh, depending on the location of the tumor and the size of the tumor, and I'm using the word tumor and cancer interchangeably, but the mass, uh, you can, if it's, if it's either in a good location or small enough, they can just take that out and save the rest of the kidney. So they have to get what are called good margins, meaning that there has to be enough space around it that, um, that, that, that they can do it. But often they will take out part of it, and they call that a partial nephrectomy. Nephrectomy is the term we use for removal of a kidney. And, and so in situations where the, the tumor isn't in such a good location um, and or it's too large and they do need to take out the whole kidney – one of the questions that patients might ask is, um, is my other kidney really capable of doing the job of two kidneys? Yeah, so so one of the things that urologists are good at is making that assessment. And uh, both they make it from their clinical judgment, but also there are what are called prognostic factors, meaning that there are things you can look at to tell you the likelihood that the person will do well. In addition to that, they can look at the kidney function for, from both kidneys separately if they're really concerned and see how good the kidney function is on the other side. So they have a lot of ways of figuring out what to do um, to, to make sure that when they take the kidney out, it doesn't lead to too much damage and that the person has adequate kidney function. I should point out, by the way, that surgery isn't always the answer. For example, in some people who aren't great surgical candidates, but let's say the tumor is small, they can destroy the tumor uh, by either heating it or cooling it, something that we call cryoablation or, or radiofrequency ablation. Of course, I reversed it. Cryo is freezing and radiofrequency is heating. But yeah, so sometimes there are other things you can do. And if that isn't possible, let's suppose the patient has a really large tumor and the other kidney isn't working all that great. Um, or maybe they don't have another kidney. You mentioned that dialysis would be in that patient's future. Some people who might be listening might be wondering whether transplant is an option. We often hear about, you know, people donating their kidney to their loved ones when in need. Is this a situation that might um, be amenable to that kind of strategy? It is. Uh, however, uh, you know, to get a, an, a solid organ transplant, it's sort of a general rule that you have to be cancer-free for two years. So in that interim period, after the cancer has been removed and before you could get a transplant, you would have to be on hemodialysis or, or something called peritoneal dialysis for a few years at a minimum. Uh, and then there's the chance, let's say, that you had a living donor, like someone who, who could give you a kidney, or there, you could get on sort of the donor list for transplant. But that's theoretically possible as long as your disease cancer-free for a few years. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the medical therapy part of this. So, you know, you mentioned that for patients who have cancer that has spread outside of the kidneys and outside of the lymph nodes, that really people like you, medical oncologists, have a role to play. So can you talk a little bit about more about how you address kidney cancer? What are the, the drugs that are available? How long do people take them? What's the side effects? What are the interesting things that might be on the horizon in terms of clinical trials for these patients? Yeah, so, so the, the, the treatment of kidney cancer, once it has spread, 
is a little variable. It depends a little bit on, well, it depends a lot on how aggressive the cancer looks. So for example, sometimes someone will have a kidney taken out, or let's say that the original mass is taken out, and then we follow them with scans, with CT scans usually, to make sure that nothing has recurred. And then let's say at some point we see a recurrence somewhere. Let's say it's in the lung, but it's very small. It's maybe um, you know a quarter of an inch in size, and it took maybe three or four years to appear. In, in, in patients like that, even though you suspect there's cancer there, you often don't do anything. And in fact, we have a way of, of separating patients again by what we call prognostic markers, um, how long it took for the thing to come back, um, whether the person is anemic, whether the person has other things that, that, that make it look as though they're sick or not. And when we add those things together, we can stratify patients into what's called low-risk disease or intermediate and high-risk disease. In low-risk disease patients, often I will not do anything. I will observe them and see what the rate of change of disease is. For these patients, sometimes you can wait for many years before doing anything. Also, if they have very little disease, sometimes we'll just treat that disease. And again, meaning, you know, take out this little thing in the lung, let's say. Um, and often they can live for, for many years without having to do anything else. Once it gets to the point that they need some sort of treatment, uh, kidney cancer is a little bit different from other tumors in that it is not responsive to classical chemotherapy. It's one of the few cancers that really isn't. It and another one, melanoma, are very, very really don't respond. What they do respond to is two different types of treatments. One is called immunotherapy, and the other um, doesn't have a good name. Uh, we either call it uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy or molecularly directed therapy, but um, <clears throat> but those are the two different types of therapies, and they're really quite different. And uh, we use them both. The the what we usually start with, in fact, these days is the immunotherapy or a combination of the immunotherapy and the tyrosine kinase therapy. The uh, immunotherapy, however, I think most academic physicians uh, start with it alone. And the reason is that the chances, if you give someone, it's really combined immune drugs. And these are drugs that, by the way, just to be clear, I call it immunotherapy because it doesn't directly attack the cancer. What it does is, is it activates the body's immune system to attack the cancer. And while there are many potential side effects, we generally feel that the side effect profile is a little bit better than the combination of immunotherapy and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And um, we feel that if you do get a response, meaning if the, tr if the tumors do shrink, they probably will stay shrunk for much longer. The difference between the different therapies, though, is that immunotherapy takes a little bit longer to work. The tyrosine kinase inhibitors work faster. So if you have someone who really has disease that's growing very rapidly and, is, and is, is, has to be treated immediately, we will give them that as part of the treatment. Um, and the side effect profiles, as I said, are complicated because, again, with immune therapies, it can attack any part of the body. Um, and some more frequently than others, but we do have ways to manage this. With the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, just stopping the medication will make the side effects go away. And the side effects in that case are things like fatigue, diarrhea, um, rashes. Those are probably the most common, but then there's really a long list. We probably don't really have time to go through it. Dr. Michael Hurwitz is an associate professor of internal medicine in medical oncology at the Yale School of Medicine. If you have questions, the address is canceranswers at yale.edu and past editions of the program are available in audio and written form at YaleCancerCenter.org. We hope you'll join us next week to learn more about the fight against cancer here on Connecticut Public Radio. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital.